Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and uh, I think of those words, O come all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. Uh, Lord, we come together. We are your faithful. Um, your spirit has caused us to be faithful. Um, and we come together even though we are online and are in our separate homes. Uh, we come together as one. Um, and we come joyful uh, because you are triumphant. Your son was triumphant on the cross. Um, his work, his completed worth, death and resurrection, the, the work that was done for us is triumphant. Uh, the war is one, Lord, and we thank you for that. And we are in times that are weary. Um, we are, are covered up and we are isolated in so many ways. Um, and so honestly, Lord, it's hard to be joyful in this season. Um, but you call us to be joyful. And when we stop and consider the great work that is done on our behalf and the great gift of your son that made himself vulnerable coming into this world, um, made himself uh, as a man uh, to be subject to this world and uh, most of all to be subject to your holy wrath, to die on our behalf, Lord, that that should bring great joy that overrides our, our current uh, temporal circumstances. Give us hearts that would um, reflect on that, that would be open to that. And forgive us, Lord, where we have hearts that are easily uh, swayed or influenced by our daily circumstances and where we diminish the great, glorious, supreme work of Christ, the sufficient work of his death and resurrection on the cross. Lord, give us hearts that would embrace the fact that we should be joyful and triumphant. Um, and Lord, not only do all of us feel some of the isolation and the disconnect, but there are others who have been directly affected by COVID, uh, whether it's in their jobs uh, whether in sickness, whether family members that are isolated from them. And really during this season that we love as families to get together, um, Lord, how hard it is that uh, so many of us have to be isolated. I pray for those who are hurting. I pray for those who are struggling, whether it's cancer has inflicted their body, whether uh, they're, they're struggling with COVID directly or loved ones are. Those whose marriages are, are struggling or uh, their kids are struggling with trying to do school online. And, and for those who are teachers that are trying to engage young hearts and young minds uh, to stay in a state of learning, I just pray for them, Lord, as this time is really, uh, we all are taking a toll um, by this virus. And we just ask for your protection, your grace, your love upon us. Uh, be with us as we continue during this Advent season. Be with Pastor Clay as he shares from your word. Um, be with our church staff, Lord, as they continue to reach out to our church family and to the family and communities around us. Give them strength. Uh, protect them from the evil one. Protect them from division, heartache, sickness, uh, keep them healthy and and vibrant and flourishing in in a time that is difficult uh, to do that, Lord. Uh, we pray for um, all of our uh, team leaders uh, in our in in our church body and for those who are committed to serve uh, week after week. We pray that you would be with them. We pray for our nation as we are in some uneasy times. In the midst of post-election, we just we know, Lord, that uh, that you um, orchestrate who's going to be in leadership and in government, and we pray that they do your bidding, that they do your work. Uh, we pray your work of um, salvation across this land, 
that many would in these difficult times come to know you as Lord and Savior, um, whether it's through pain or through blessing or through miracles, that they would come to know you in a way that they um, had never seen or understood or embraced before. Lord, be with us now as we continue our service. Be with Clay as he delivers the message. Uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, and uh, we are glad that you can join us, um, even on video, and because um, it's hard, I know, to be isolated in your home from everybody and not to have the fellowship, but we're glad you could make it, even in this version. Um, we are celebrating communion next week, and so today we uh, would like you to... Uh, Prepare your hearts this week, really. And so I'd like to share a little a few thoughts on that. I, you know, in this COVID season where we wear a mask, a protective covering, and, and we're isolating in our homes, uh, whether it's uh, quarantining or just staying safe, um, I'm reminded of uh, the story in Exodus where God is intending to free the Israelites from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And, um, and he instructs the Israelites to take a unblemished lamb and the blood of the lamb and to put it on the doorposts of, of the doorway uh, on the sides and the covering on the top so that the, the blood would cover over their homes, protecting them um, from the spirit of the Lord who was coming to exact judgment on Pharaoh um, and the Egyptians for enslaving his people. And and uh, that every family uh, that did not have blood covering would suffer the wrath of God's judgment. And, and uh, not only were the Israelites instructed to have that covering over their home, but they were instructed to stay in their homes until morning uh, so as to stay safe um, from the wrath and from the spirit of the Lord. Uh, and... Uh, you know, communion is a celebration of God's protective covering through the blood of Jesus Christ over our hearts, over our sin. Um, but instead of the temporary version that the Israelites experienced, it's a forever version that we are protected um, and made new through the blood of Christ. And uh, Romans 4, 7 through 8 says, Blessed are they whose lawless acts are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. And so I want to encourage you uh, this week as you wear your mask and you uh, stay safe and protected in your home, um, remember that um, there's a greater protection, a greater covering that you have um, that, that blocks us from any wrath of God, that that even the most microscopic of our sins does not somehow bleed through the covering of the blood of Jesus. It covers over us so that uh, we won't experience God's wrath and that we get to spend eternity with him because of that covering, because of the blood of Christ. And so every time you put your mask on or you see it this week or you hear about the numbers of COVID um, or you're bemoaning the fact that you're isolated in your home. Remember, uh, there's an eternal protection you have. Uh, there's a, a great covering that lasts and blocks all sin um, from doing its damage to us. And, uh, and so that you would prepare your hearts thinking next week for such a glorious covering and protection and mask over uh, our sin that we get to enjoy. Um, so that when you come next week, you come with hearts that are rejoicing and, and rejoicing and triumphant as we sing. Um, if this is your first time watching, uh, welcome. We are glad you could join us. Um, just a few announcements to let you and remind you of. If you have a prayer request, uh, you can send it to prayer at tacomacrc.org. Um, and please let us know if, if the request is a public or private. Private requests will be sent to the prayer chain and a public requests will be sent to our prayer team. 
Uh, adult Sunday School class will be available here on YouTube uh, by 8 o'clock each Sunday morning. Um, and so we're continuing this morning Discipleship 101. And, um, and so we just wanted to uh, invite you and encourage you to watch that. You can watch that on YouTube. Um, today's offering is for the general fund. And um, just to remind you that uh, offerings can be done um, either donations for the general fund offering today or the Christmas project can also be done via online, uh, via our website, um, on the church center app. Um, and just to let you know, uh, a few upcoming, um, service times. So we have Christmas Eve services. We are going to have a 5:30 and a 7 PM, uh, Christmas Eve service. And the New Year's Eve uh, service will be 7 p.m. You can RSVP um, both of those services uh, the Monday before each service, basically. Uh, feel free to and uh, go ahead and RSVP as to which service on Christmas Eve and if you're going to be at the New Year's Eve service. Um, our Christmas project this year uh, is the Shelters for Haiti. And our ministry team um, is giving a great report. Um, we have basically the first of three weeks of giving. So we are hoping to raise uh, $25,000 to cover uh, seven shelters in Hades to build those shelters. And uh, actually in our first week, we have already raised $24,649. So praise the Lord for that amount already. Um, but you know, there is a greater need than just seven shelters in Haiti. And um, if you happen to hear Dave's announcement about uh, analogy of starfish, there are more starfish to throw back into the water to save. And so there are certainly more shelters to, to build. Um, and so, and each shelter costs about $3,500. So feel free, even though we've almost hit our mark of 25,000, please, be encouraged to to give um, even above and beyond that because it would be uh, wonderful for us to be able to provide money for even more shelters if possible. So again, you can give uh, online for that as well. So um, I think that should do it. And on to Clay and have a wonderful Sunday morning. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Today is the third Sunday of Advent and on this day we light the candle of joy, rejoicing in the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ and rejoicing that we know he will return. This is profoundly good news, but sometimes even good news can be scary. Maybe the good news is your graduation. After years of study and reading and, and papers and projects, you finally have accomplished your task. You walk across that stage to receive that diploma with your head held high, soaking in the pride of your parents, the pride of your teachers, and even the pride you have of yourself. You toss your cap triumphantly, but when the fanfare ceases, you wonder, what now? How will I take on my next journey without the safety net of the friends, parents, and teachers that I have become so comfortable with? Maybe you received the good news that you got the job. Of all the candidates who applied, the company chose you. You are excited and encouraged, but also maybe a little nervous. This job will be a challenge. On the outside, you smile and you say thank you for this awesome opportunity, but inside, you're asking yourself, can I do it? Will I let the company down? Did I oversell my abilities? Maybe it's a proposal and you feel so loved because they want to marry you. You are the apple of someone's eye. And that same thought also terrifies you. Will I be a good husband, a good wife? 
Will I make a will we make a good life together? Will it last? Or maybe you just received the news that you're going to be a mother or a father and emotions flood over you. There is this deep inward joy that you and your spouse are going to raise a little one whose very flesh and bones are derived from your combined DNA or in the case of adoption, that you are being given the opportunity to give love and life and a forever family to this precious child. But any of us who parent, who are parents also know that fear. We know the pressure of this heavy responsibility. We want to do it right, but we know so little about how to do it right. So let those emotions, those mixed emotions, rest heavily in your heart. Feel them. Remember them. If you haven't experienced them yet, then imagine them. And now multiply them. And you might begin to experience some of what Mary, the mother of Jesus, felt when the birth of her firstborn son was foretold to her. I want us to read Luke's account of the announcement that the angel Gabriel made to Mary. We're going to break this into three readings, and as we read each one, we will focus on one aspect of what is being foretold to Mary in this annunciation of the birth of Christ. The first is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. So please turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Okay, so let's try for just a moment to imagine if an angel had appeared to you. And not just any angel. This is Gabriel. He is the same angel that appeared to Daniel at least twice, giving him understanding and insight and to announce the coming of the Messiah. This is the same angel that appeared to Zechariah the priest to announce the birth of John, who would serve as the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. It appears that Gabriel's job is to announce the Messiah. So imagine the trumpets, imagine the fanfare as the king is being announced by the angel Gabriel. That's what he does. He foretells the plan of God's redemption through the Messiah. And notice the first message that is foretold to Mary. It is a foretold favor. Gabriel says, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. There's two thoughts in this greeting that I want us to explore today. First, the greeting, you are highly favored. You who are full of grace, you who are chosen by God. The angel is telling Mary that she is chosen by God, like the great men of the Old Testament times had been chosen by God. So think Moses in the burning bush, or the voice of God calling Samuel three times, or Isaiah before the throne of God and the seraphim bringing him a hot coal to touch his lips. For those great men, those were life-altering callings. And this is a life-altering calling for Mary. Just like Moses, Samuel, and Isaiah, this young girl is being called to play a vital role in God's plan to bring redemption to the world. 
And that fact is not lost on her. We're told that Mary was greatly troubled by this greeting. The word means that she's confused, she's perplexed. It goes on to say that she wondered what kind of greeting this was. And that word wondered also means to argue. It, she is arguing in her mind about what this means. Why would God choose her? She isn't important. Unlike her relative Elizabeth, who is the wife of a priest, she has no influential status. She is from the small town of Nazareth in Galilee that Luke has to even inform his listeners is in Galilee because it is of such little importance. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And here Gabriel says, God has chosen you. You are the one upon whom his favor rests. You are the one that I choose to carry out my plan. And the second thing I want you to notice in this greeting is Gabriel's statement, the Lord is with you. This statement isn't a wish or even a blessing. It is an assurance, an assurance of the reality of the situation. He's saying, do not be afraid, Mary. You have the power to do this because the Lord is with you. I can understand why Mary is troubled by this greeting. Don't you? Haven't you at some point in your life been asked to take responsibility for something that you didn't know how you were going to accomplish? You have more in common with Mary than you might think at first. Hear this greeting for yourself, greetings, my children, you who are highly favored, you who I have chosen to proclaim the good news of my kingdom. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded and do not be afraid. For God is with you to the very ends of the age. We look at Mary and we are amazed that God would choose such a humble young girl. But how often do we forget that he has also chosen us? Please understand that as a believer in Christ, you too are favored by God. He didn't make a mistake in choosing you. He has a plan upon, he has placed upon you an incredible responsibility to proclaim the gospel. This is his plan, so don't be afraid. God is with you. Now join me with reading verses 31 through 35. The angel goes on to say, You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. At this point, Gabriel gets down to the reason for his visit. In the Old Testament, when God called Moses, he told him that he would set his people free from the clutches of Pharaoh. And he told Abraham that he would give him a land flowing with milk and honey and that he would have many descendants, one of whom would be a blessing to the whole earth. He often told the prophets about what he had in store for the nation. He let them in on his plan, at least to a degree. And he does the same with Mary. He provides her with a foretold future. 
I find it fascinating here that Mary understood Gabriel's announcement to be something that would take place in the immediate future. She understood that this wasn't going to be later after she had married Joseph and that the two of them conceived a child. She asks the question, how can this be since I am a virgin? She's expecting this soon. She's not thinking it'll take place by natural means, but she is still puzzled with how it will take place. And the angel tells her some of what her future holds. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and you will conceive a child. You will give birth to a child. This child will be God's son not Joseph's. But notice that the future that Gabriel was most interested in proclaiming, at least until Mary asked him how this was going to be accomplished, wasn't Mary's future. It was the foretold future of Jesus the Messiah. Gabriel foretells five future acclamations of this child. He says that he will be called great, Secondly, that he will be the son of the Most High. Third, he will sit on the throne of David. Fourth, he will reign over the house of Judah. And fifth, his kingdom will never end. These are the descriptions of the Messiah. Gabriel is telling Mary that her child, the one to be born to her, will be the Messiah. Israel has been waiting for this future. In days when it seemed far away, in days when persecution and occupation left the Jewish people crying out for deliverance, in days when the eyes could not see salvation, hope held on to the promise of the coming Messiah. And Mary is told, the future is coming soon. Your deliverance is upon you and you are to name him Jesus Yahweh saves Gabriel doesn't explain the name to Mary but in Matthew 1 21 we see that an angel also appeared to Joseph we don't know if it was Gabriel but there is no no strong reason to doubt that it isn't Gabriel or that it is Gabriel because he has the same message for Joseph. A child will be born, and you are to give him the name Jesus. But in this case, he adds, because he will save his people from their sins. And here we begin to see that this kingdom, this, that is coming, that it is not a political kingdom. It is God's reign over the hearts of his children. It is God providing the door to eternal life and salvation. The kingdom restores creation into a whole relationship with the creator. And this kingdom far exceeds any earthly ruler. And Mary's son is the king who reigns on that throne. I'm still not sure that Mary fully understood. And sometimes I'm not sure we do either. When faced with the promise of a world of peace and goodness, sometimes I think we too say, how can this be? And at Advent, while we wait for the return of our King, we are reminded of the words of Gabriel. Our king is great. He is the son of God. He sits enthroned in heaven and he rules over every earthly kingdom, not just Judah, every kingdom. And his kingdom will never end. Our king will bring it to pass. This is how we find joy in the darkness. This is how we can rejoice in the face of hardship. We know that for unto us a child is born. 
to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace we know and we rejoice because our future is united in christ and this future has been foretold in verse 36 through 37, Gabriel gives Mary even more assurance. He says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Church, today I want you to hold on to that last statement, for no word from God will ever fail. Repeat that to yourself. I encourage you right now, say it out loud with me. Join me, for no word from God will ever fail. Mary has been given a foretold fulfillment. God's word will not fail. It will be fulfilled. If God is able to open the womb of an old barren woman and fulfill his promises to her to conceive and give birth, then he is able to fulfill his promise to Mary as well. And if this child to be born is the Messiah, then God is able to fulfill his promises to us as well. My family, we have been called by God. Just like Mary, you and I have been called by God to be bearers of his son. Not in the flesh as Mary was, but in the image. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ. We are called to imitate Christ. We are called to proclaim the gospel with joy and with purpose. We're called to be true disciples who disciple others. No, an angel has not appeared to us, but a messenger just as real has come nonetheless. It is the word of God itself. You have been called. Greetings you who are highly favored. How will you answer the call? Look at verse 38 and see how Mary did. It said, she said, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I pray that each one of us will answer with these same words. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. It's easy to lose sight of our calling. It's easy to be so focused on our earthly kingdoms that we lose sight of our true purpose. May you today hear the voice of the angel as he calls to you, as he gives you his message. God is with you. To his children, he is saying, don't be afraid. My spirit is in you and will accomplish my work through you. Just answer the call. And in the fullness of time, God will fulfill it. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask you to help us to not be afraid. Allow us to answer the call that you have put upon each of our lives. The way that I fulfill that call may be different from the way someone else does, but it is the same call. It is the call to proclaim the good news. It is the call to live our lives in a way that they reflect you and your goodness. It is a call to redemption. Lord, we ask you to help us live in that truth. As we think about Mary, as we think about this story, may we answer the way she did, even in spite of our fears, Lord. May we answer 
the way she did, that I am your servant. May it be, may your word be fulfilled in me. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today, as you continue to reflect upon this call that was put upon Mary and the call that is put upon you, may you too walk in the assurance of knowing that God is with you. God the Father has shared his love with you. God the Son has bestowed his grace upon you. And God the Holy Spirit indwells you and empowers you to fulfill this call. May you be blessed in knowing and be assured of these truths. In Jesus' name, amen.